Glad you came. And uh, the title on your uh, workshop said, uh, The Search for the Saving Message in uh, Acts through Revelation. Here it says, The Search for the Saving Message Outside the Gospel of John. Well, it's, I'll explain that in a moment. First, I want to, somebody asked me about that logo thing there. I didn't do that. I'm not, I can't do stuff like that. But he wanted to know where I got it. And um, a friend of mine, John Gooding, did this. And John has a new ministry called 289 Design. They're down in the foyer. So I didn't intend to advertise for them. But they, they do such good work um, to help me, to help our church. Uh, the logo that, that I had up there this morning, the unique eternal role of resurrected people, his partner, Amy, did that. And I, said, I gave her the title. I said, lots of luck. You know, what do you do with that? And she came up with that. I said, wow, that's, that is awesome. But anyway, they, uh, they're a ministry. They're a mission, they're, they consider themselves a ministry. They're not an organization to make money. They have support. They're like missionaries. So that's why they can help people, help churches and people in their ministry at such a low rate. So, if you need some help in that area, I highly recommend them. But that wasn't my point. To, it just came up. Steve asked me about it. Now, last year, I uh, had a talk in a plenary session on the search for the saving message outside the Gospel of John. Uh, some of you might have been there. And basically, I just covered the Gospels. And I, uh, if you weren't there, let me just review briefly what I shared, and then today we're going to just go and act through Revelation in terms of some things I want to bring out, and then we'll see what thoughts you have. Many years ago, a, f- uh, a young man came to meet with me named John Cohen, and he was a Jew, or he is a Jew, he's still alive, um, but he was in his 20s, and he wasn't saved, but he didn't know anything about Jesus, and growing up in East Texas, he'd heard indirectly about Jesus, but he virtually knew nothing. And uh, he was concerned about what would happen when he died, and he heard that Jesus might have something to do with helping him after he died. And he said, uh, somebody told me I'm, I might want to come and talk to you because I'm having some trouble. He said, I've been reading the Bible and I've read and read and read, and I'm all the, I've read all the way through Deuteronomy, and I haven't found Jesus in there yet. And I said, just keep reading, you'll run into him. <laughs> no, I didn't say that. But there are many well-meaning people, as you know, well-meaning people that would have said, John, you're in the Old Testament. You need to go to the New Testament. And you need to start here at the beginning. There's four stories about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And you just need to start reading those. So last year I walked us through what John would have found if he just started reading through Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And in my opinion, it's just overwhelming when you put yourself in the shoes of an unsaved person reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke looking to find how to have eternal life. Because the only conclusion he could possibly come to is that you've got to do good works. And the only uh, only passage with a pulse to it is the thief on the cross, which comes all the way at the end of Luke. And I think it's possible, if not probable, there have been people saved reading that passage. But... It may very well be that somebody helped them to see that there's more going on there than just what Luke records. That's uh, kind of a summary. I I mentioned that my search for the saving message outside of John started back in my seminary days in a personal conversation with Zane when he said, you can't find one verse in Matthew, Mark, or Luke that tells you how to have eternal life. And I just, I was stunned. I just never heard anything like that. It just, it blew me away. And I mentioned last year, I haven't found one yet after all these years. Well, in recent years, um, last, I don't know, I don't know how many years, 
I, I don't know why I hadn't thought of it before. I started to expand my thinking. Well, what about the rest of the New Testament? You know, if we just keep going, what do we find? And so that's what I want to talk about this morning. What do we find? Let's suppose John Cohen said he got through me. <laughs> He got through Matthew, Mark, and Luke said, I'm so discouraged in these Gospels, I'm going to go to Acts. And he skipped John. Okay, what if he did that? Now, I'm, not going to, I'm going to approach this a little different. I'm not going to go Acts, Revelation, 1 Corinthians like I did Matthew, Mark, and Luke. I'm just going to kind of cut to the chase here uh, today. And I'm going to say up front that Acts through Revelation isn't like Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We can find the saving message in Acts through Revelation. Let me show you one passage. In fact, it's an awesome passage. First on your notes, I put John 6.47. Let me talk about that first. Just to make sure we're on the same page, which I'm sure we are. This is the saving message. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me has everlasting life. The three key elements to the saving message are believe, Number one, Jesus. Number two, everlasting life. Number three. That is the essence of the saving message. Believe in Jesus for everlasting life. So that's my, not my standard. To me, that is the standard when we're looking for the saving message. Do we find that you have to believe? Do we find that you have to believe in Jesus? And do we find that you're believing in him for everlasting life? Okay, that's our standard as in our search as we go into Acts through Revelation. Sure enough, 1 Timothy 1.16. Oh, I should have said, and there's a bunch of other verses in John. There they are in parentheses. All right, 1 Timothy 1.16. You know this passage. Paul, Paul says, For this reason I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show all longsuffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. How could it be any clearer that Paul is telling us this is the saving message. It's the message that Paul believed. And not only that, notice the word pattern here. It's the pattern. That, that word is so significant here in this verse. This is the pattern for those who are going to believe. He is the pattern. Paul is the pattern for all those that are going to believe in Jesus, or on him, on Jesus, for everlasting life. Now, isn't that refreshing to read that? Because wouldn't we want, wouldn't we hope that Paul's message would be the same as Jesus' message? (laughs) I mean, I would be, I would be heartsick if Paul had a different message saving message than Jesus had. And Paul says right here, no, it's the same message. Same message that Jesus gave, same message that Paul gives. And he says it's the pattern for those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. I'm changing my words a little bit. You understand what I'm saying? Paul is the pattern, but the point is, all those that are going to believe on Jesus for everlasting life are doing what Paul did. All right. Here's another verse. 1 John 5:13 These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Do we have believe? Yes. Do we have Jesus? Yeah, we've got the name in the context we know it's Jesus, right? I mean, I'm not trying to just say it's got to be in that exact verse. That would be helpful, but it's 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 there in the context. Not there in the verse, but it's there in the context. Do we have everlasting life? Eternal life? Yes. Now, you know, I'm sure that John isn't writing this passage to unsaved people. He's writing to believers to reassure them and remind them of what they already have. So even though we find those terms, believe, Jesus, everlasting life, it's not addressed to unbelievers, but you can still... See the essence of the saving message in that verse. Okay, now before we go on, let me tell you a little story. And you can relate to this, I'm sure. Um, It's been real helpful for me to be able to teach in different countries in recent years. And uh, I've had the privilege of teaching um, 
the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ in nine different Eastern European countries. And every country I go to, no matter what the course is, I always ask them somewhere in the course, usually at the beginning, can you think of a passage in Matthew, Mark, and Luke that tells you how to have eternal life? Can you think of a passage in Acts or Revelation that tells you how to have eternal life? Can you think of a passage in the Old Testament that tells you how to have eternal life? But when it comes to the section on Acts or Revelation, can you think of a passage that tells you in Acts or Revelation how to have everlasting life? It was amazing. I got the same verses every time in every country. And probably in most of our churches in our country, we probably get basically the same verses. And those are the next six that I've listed. Acts 16.31. It always came up. And it's good that it does come up. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. I love that verse, don't you? It's just an awesome verse. Because it's so clear that all you have to do is believe in Jesus for everlasting life, right? Does it say that? But you know that it means everlasting life, but it doesn't say everlasting life. He believes on the Lord, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And I'm going to tell you, John Cohen, my friend, was reading through Acts, he'd have been totally confused by the time he got to chapter 16, wouldn't he? He'd have had to go through Acts 2.38, for example. <laughs> okay. But by the time he gets here, he's totally confused. But when he gets here, maybe the Holy Spirit could help him get through all that other that would just confuse him totally. But even here, does he know what saved means? I don't know. We are so familiar with the term, we easily understand what Paul's saying here about saved. Now, Zane did a talk on this three years ago, if you were here for it. It was a great talk where he talked about Acts 16.31. And he taught us that, those of you that were there, how do we know, where did we get our idea of saved? Who remembers? Anybody? John 3.17. He said if it wasn't, we get it from John. Uh, Luke assumes that the reader already knows what saved means because the reader is always already familiar with the teaching of John. Maybe not Theophilus, I don't know, but uh, any other readers. Uh, certainly Theophilus knew what it meant to be saved. Uh, Luke assumes that the reader already understands that, and we assume that we know what it means because we learn it from John 3.17. Uh, God did not send the Son of the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved in the context of 3.16, 18, right in the middle. Okay? So, is it the saving message in Acts 16.31? Yes and no. Yes, it is. But is it clear to an unsaved reader? I don't think so. We, we, it is to us, but not necessarily to an unsaved reader. All right, let's go to another Great passage on that, that we all love. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. By grace you've been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. I mean, I've used this, and I'm sure you have to, so many times with so many people to help them see that it's not by works. I mean, this verse is I just my favorite to show people that Eternal life is not gained by works. Okay, let's put this passage to the test. Do we have belief? We'll take that, won't we? Because it's the same word. Okay. Faith. Do we have Jesus? Nope. It's not, Jesus isn't even in the passage. He's in the context, but not in the verse. But we know what he's talking about because we, we already understand that. Do we have eternal life? Nope. We have saved, and we know what that means. Now, notice the obvious. By grace, you will be saved. What's it say? Have been. So who's he writing to? Believers reminding us of what we already know to make his points that he wants to make to believers. It's not a passage written to unbelievers to present the saving message. 
Okay, so it's, is the saving message there? Well, yes and no. It's there if we already have an understanding of the terms, but it's not there necessarily to an unsaved reader. All right, Romans 4, 5. To him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Let's put this to the test. Do we have belief? Do we have Jesus? Uh, yeah. Context, you'll find Jesus. Okay. In fact, it's a capital H there. So uh, that's Jesus. Do we have eternal life? No. We have accounted for righteousness. We don't have eternal life. Now, my question for you to think about is, would my unsaved friend know what this means? I don't think so. Maybe, but I doubt it. Would my unsaved Jewish friend know what accounted for righteousness means? Maybe he would. Maybe he'd know, oh, that means that's equivalent to gaining everlasting life. But I doubt it personally. Just doubt it. So then we have to ask, well, why, do, why, why didn't Paul say, his faith is accounted for everlasting life. I mean, what's, why would he use righteousness? Because it's Romans. Who's he writing to? Believers. Believers, very clear from the very beginning of the book. And his purpose in Romans is not to tell readers how to have everlasting life. He's writing to people that already have it to tell them how to live the victorious Christian life. And... The victorious Christian life begins with everlasting life, but in terms of living life, it begins with righteousness. In other words, if I'm going to live a life of practical righteousness, I have to know who I am in Christ, that I am positionally righteous. That's why Paul emphasizes righteousness in this verse, not eternal life, because he assumes we already know that we have eternal life. He's reminding us that we have righteousness in Christ because we have eternal life. So, is the saving message in Romans 4, 5? Well, kind of, if we assume what, what we as believers already know. Okay, let's go to Romans 10, 9, and 10. Grace people are very familiar with this, right? But we'll look at it just for a moment. Do you confess with your mouth? The Lord Jesus, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Um, the key to this, in my opinion, is verse 10. 10 explains 9. With the heart one believes. Well, first I should ask my questions. Do we have believe? Yeah, in verse 10, we have believe. Do we have Jesus? Yep, if we, if we can put that together. Um, we have believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Verse 10, believe unto righteousness, which implies we're believing in Jesus. Do we have everlasting life? If you know what saved means. Yeah. Uh, if you know what saved means. But in Romans, saved means something different than it meant in Ephesians. Right? Some, lots of you are familiar with this. Saved in Romans means saved from wrath, which means saved from the power of sin in your daily life. Justified is the positional term here, which is the same term he used back in chapter 4, verse 5 that we talked about. So what Paul's saying is, just quickly, when you believe in Jesus, in your heart, you become righteous in the sight of God. And if you want to live victoriously to be saved from the power of sin, you need to be confessing Jesus with your mouth. So do we have the saving message here? Well, wow. I think my friend John Cohen would be totally confused here, as many, many people are still confused with Romans 10, 9, and 10 because... They don't understand the argument of Romans, the use of the term salvation in Romans. This is uh, this is not intended. These words these words are not intended for the unsaved reader for sure. 
Do we have a saving message in here? We see it. We know it's there because we're grounded in the truth that you believe in Jesus for everlasting life. We can interpret this and understand it, but it's really not clear. A saving message to an unsaved reader. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. I delivered to you first of all that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. Let's put this to the test. Do we have belief? No, it's not there. How about eternal life? Nope. Do we have Jesus? Yeah, Christ. And we have that Jesus died for our sins and rose again, so that's that's important information about Jesus. But do we have believe in Jesus for eternal life? No, we don't. And some have said, as you know, and there's been a lot of work in the by Bob and Zane and who else? Some others have done some work on this lately. But here's a comment I want to make. There are millions of people, as you know, in the world that believe that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead that don't have eternal life. I mean, millions. So, believing that Jesus died for our sins and rose from the dead does not mean that we we gain eternal life. Um, So, this verse really isn't clear on the saving message either. Okay, Revelation 3.20. Now, with this group, I don't think I need to spend a whole lot of time here, do I? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Uh, First, do we have Jesus? Yeah, we sure do. In context, definitely. Do we have belief? No. This isn't about believing in him. Do we have everlasting life? No, because it's not about everlasting life. It's speaking to a believer, or a church, I should say, uh, of believers, where Jesus wants to have fellowship with them. So this passage has nothing to do uh, with the saving message. Now, these are the six that always seem to come up. Uh, these are the ones that people, in my opinion, most often go to. And... Uh, The six that we've looked at, none of them, in my opinion, none of them compare to John 6.47, John uh, 3.16. They just just aren't clear and they assume that the reader understands what's being said. Okay, I added five more. These don't come up very often, uh, but I'll, I'll just... Comment on briefly. Acts 10.43. Peter says to Cornelius and his people, To him all the prophets witness that through his name everyone who believes in him will receive remission of sins. Do we have Jesus? Do we have belief? Do we have everlasting life? No, we have remission of sins. Now, it is true that when you believe in Jesus for eternal life, you receive positional forgiveness. But how many times do we find that in the Gospel of John, believe in Jesus for the reason? Now, he mentions it to the disciples for a reason in the upper room, but never to an unsaved person. Jesus never told anybody to believe in him for remission of sins. So now the question is, why is Peter bringing this up here? First of all, I'm certain I mean, I'll just bet on this. <laughs> that when I get to heaven, I'm going to find out that Peter told them to believe in Jesus for everlasting life. He also told them to believe in Jesus for forgiveness of sins. That's my opinion. I believe that. Because Paul said the pattern is to believe on Jesus for everlasting life. Just because we Luke's recorded... What we read doesn't mean that's everything Peter said, right? Peter, I mean, it only takes, what, three minutes maybe to read Peter's message to the Gentiles there. I don't think Peter spoke for just three minutes. I think he said more than what we read. The question is, why did Luke record 
this part of what Peter said, believe in Jesus for remission of sins. That's the issue. Because Luke is selecting what he writes for a purpose. His purpose is not to present the saving message or to say what the saving message is. His purpose is to emphasize something that's important to his argument. And in that section, the issue is, do Gentiles, the issue is, do Gentiles have equal standing with God along with Jews? Forgiveness of sins emphasizes relationship with God, not eternal life, but relationship with God that eternal life brings. And that's what the Jews back in Jerusalem couldn't hardly get over when Peter came back and told him. They didn't have a problem with Gentiles gaining eternal life. They had a problem that Peter ate with Gentiles. And the foundation of eating with Gentiles is to know, hey, we all have equal fellowship with God. And fellowship with God starts with positional forgiveness, goes to practical forgiveness. We're all together in the family. So Luke's purpose in emphasizing, and even Peter's purpose in saying it, was to emphasize relationship with God. Forgiveness is the foundation or the Positional forgiveness is the first step in that relates three five. I'm saying that yes. Okay. So do we have the saving message in Acts ten forty three? Yeah, yeah, we do, but we kind of don't because the emphasis of Jesus it was always on everlasting life. And it might not be clear to an unsaved reader that forgiveness is equivalent to everlasting life. Maybe it could be, but certainly it's not the same terminology and preciseness that we find in John. All right. Galatians 2.16, that's the same as Romans 4.5, justified. It's the same concept. Titus 3.5, that's the same as concept as Romans 2.8 and 9, in my opinion. It's great to show that uh, it has nothing to do with works. Revelation 22.17, Spirit and the bride say, Come, let one who hears say, Come, let him who thirst come, whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. Great passage. I've, I've brought it up even in evangelism sometimes, but as a supplemental passage. Do we have belief? Do we have Jesus? Do we have everlasting life? Kind of, yeah. If, if, if we explain what water of life is, yes. But, but, but what I like, what you probably like about the passage is it's such a great passage to emphasize that it's free. But to, we don't really see the saving message here. All right, now having gone through this, and I'm going to open up for questions in a moment. When I went through this, what I just did with you, I was shocked. This wasn't but a few years ago. I thought only two, two verses in Acts through Revelation that you know that just that have the elements clearly presented. It just blew me away. I just almost as much as it blew me away that I that I couldn't find one in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It almost blew me away as much to say in Acts of Revelation I can only find two clear ones. It just, it's just kind of mind-boggling. But it teaches me, again, that the content of the books are self-evident. That the writers of the New Testament, except for John, all of them, from Matthew to Revelation, except for John, assume that the reader already knows and has believed the saving message. Okay. Question? Well, 
there are millions of people that believe that we're saved by works. But they also believe that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead. But they're saying, that's good. He made it. That's the same thing as when I ask someone, you know, do they believe that Jesus did this? And they say yes. And I ask them, does you have eternal life? And their response is, well, no, it's not. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's my point. Right. Did everybody hear that? Everybody hear that? Okay, Renee. Uh, I, I find it helpful to make a distinction between um, what we get and what God does and what is taken and what we uh, receive. In other words, I happen to differ a little bit with what you said in regards to justification. I think a person in the Old Testament, we would being declared righteous, and a legal status meant Abraham 15.6, quoted in Romans 4.2, is to validate 3.21 through 31. And although that, that is a, obviously a, a book written to believers, that's a section to respond to 118 to 320 to the lost. Within the book written to believers, to clarify how they were justified, which an Old Testament and certainly a person coming into the church would be taught because that was the concept of everything taught within the Old Testament. So that what you get in, in, in Romans 3.25, every time you get justification and the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. In Hebrews 9.22, that was the basis for covenant. And so that was the Hilasterion, which was Leviticus 16, which was Genesis 15.6, which is what uh, a believer gets. That would equate that to eternal life. One is what God does. He justifies the believer. The other one is what a, re- a believer receives, eternal life. Those are different but related. Okay. Forgiveness of sins is, one, is what a believer gets taken away as... Delivered is what a believer gets delivered from. Those two are taken. Believer gets taken from hell by being delivered in soteriological, in a soteriological sense, and uh, he receives forgiveness of sins. Sins are taken from him in a positional sense. Justif- justification is what God does to declare a person in the courtroom in his tribunal, in a sense. And uh, a believer then receives eternal life. So those two things, I would tend to differ. I, I would think that, that that would be understood. And if not, and a believer would get taught that because that is the essence of the entire Torah. And, and even in a fellowship sense, that, that was by grace. So I would tend to differ a little bit. Yeah, that, but Are you I don't, about the Jewish... Uh, the Jew? Yeah. Okay, well, if he's an Orthodox Jew. But it doesn't matter what you well, are. Well, most of the Jews that I know don't even know the Old Testament. Well, yeah, people have wrong ideas, but that doesn't make the Bible based on anyone's wrong idea. They need to know what the Bible teaches, not right. what they want to impose. I mean, Jesus did that in Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount. They came with their own premise, but he went back to the law, and he said, you say this, but I say this is the essence of the law. That's just, but I appreciate that. I appreciate what you said, and I think those are good definitions, and uh, I just don't understand where you, what you're saying when you say you differ, but I don't know. Yeah, I think there's more salvation here that I just don't feel comfortable in saying John is the only book, although I, I do agree that John's primary thrust within it. I think the reason that John uses the term <coughs> life is he wants to put... John wants to emphasize the positiveness of why a person is born again, as opposed to just, when you use justification, he wants to emphasize what a believer gets in a legal statement declared in God's tribunal. So I think it's just the way the the writer, the the authorial intent of the writer wants to stress. The point of John is life. It's what what a believer ought to be living, uh, not just positioning, but practically. That's why I think John uses life. Uh, I think Paul uses, he's comfortable with using justification because he wants to emphasize what God does for a believer. 
But if you look at 5, 12 through 21, and Jim gave a very good workshop, the point gets fleshed out in life and in justification in 12 uh, through 21. Going into the sanctification section, similar to what I think John does in the whole gospel with the word life. The problem is the misunderstanding of life in John, I find, in our circles and outside. Life in a Jewish sense never really means just being born again. It means relationship with Torah, which now Jesus is, and you begin to get that once you're born again. So that it's more qualitative in a sense, not just uh, position. So you're saying John 10.10? 10, 10? Yes, and not, not, well, not just 10.10, 10, but you have it in all throughout. Peter says in 6, well shall we go that has the words of eternal life. Peter's born again already. <coughs> what does he mean by that? Uh, you know, uh, even Nicodemus, you follow the end of 316, the whole point is that the wrath abides on one who doesn't believe, and wrath is always a result of actions, not just in position. If you're in a position uh, of sin, you're going to result in action. So wrath is always a manifestation of actions that God unleashes. Mm -hmm. So I, I think all throughout John, um, the point of life is not just to be born again. That is the means to an end. Okay. All right, anybody else have a question? Yeah. Um, when you think of the men that God used um, to use those three essentials, what, you have four, and you have Luke, you have Paul, Peter, and John, right? Is there any others that had the three essentials? Say that again, please. <clears throat> when you look at the three essentials, believe in Jesus for eternal life, you have God used three or four men that we see in the New Testament. Luke, as the Lord Acts, Peter, Paul, and John. Is there any others that we see that have those three essentials to penning God's word? Okay, we have Luke because of Acts sixteen thirty one. Yeah. <clears throat> we have Peter because of or no we don't have Peter, do we have Timothy? That'd be Paul. First Timothy. Mm -hmm. Paul is in Paul is right. And John. Just three. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we have. Right. Right. Seems like it. And, and it's really great. I mean, because when you're sharing the gospel, you use those three essentials. I mean, I, I can understand what Renee's saying, but wait, it's... How would I share that when I'm sharing with a, a lost person where when you have the three essentials, it's really simple. Yeah. And, and, it, and it connects. It's more clear. Yeah. Okay. Diane? Is it possible to believe in Jesus, the justification, and not know you have eternal life? Oh, sure. I, I mean, it just depends on the mindset of the person. I mean, I don't know what a person would be thinking when they hear justification. I mean, wouldn't you have to know you have eternal life to be justified? I mean, in order to be justified, isn't it that person who has eternal life and knows they have eternal life and wants to be justified? It seems to me that eternal destiny is the issue, that I know my eternal destiny is secure. That, and I, you know, if, if a person understood, okay, now that I'm declared right before God, which is what justified means, as, as I understand it. I think a person could understand that means, therefore, that my eternal destiny is secure. I mean, I don't think a, per, a person may not. It's like when I was a kid. I don't. When I was saved, I was thinking about heaven. You know, I wasn't thinking about the term eternal life. I was thinking, I'm going to go to heaven, and I know it for sure. I sure wasn't thinking that I was justified. But, you know, maybe somebody else could think that as long as they understand, you know, my eternal destiny is certain. And if, if a person thinks, I'm saved, which probably lots of people have said, I'm saved. I believed in Jesus for salvation. Well, what does that mean to them? If it means to them, I'm saved from hell and I'm going to heaven, which probably lots of people do. And even on the belief uh, that Jesus died for our sins. Zane, I love uh, Zane's message that he gave. He made it very clear 10 years ago. 
that lots of people that believe that Jesus died for their sins and rose from the dead, at the same time are believing, therefore, I know that I have eternal life. Right? I mean, I agree with what he said. They might not be thinking up front, I have everlasting life, but they're thinking, well, he paid the price and everything's okay with God, and they know that their eternal destiny is certain. That's the word righteousness. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I don't think that the issue here is what's at the forefront of a person's mind in terms of their terminology. But what is important is that they have, they're certain that their eternal destiny is safe with God. And I'm glad this came out in the discussion. I'm not saying that people can't get saved by reading Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Acts 16, 31. I think there have been many that have. 1 Corinthians 15. Because God takes information and can break through and fill in and supply and touch the heart and open the eyes. But it's the certainty of one's eternal destiny that is at stake. My point here today is to show that the clearest statements of the saving message are far and away in John, in my firm opinion. Yeah, we probably could see these in Acts through Revelation, but they're, they're not very many. And uh, in my opinion, there's only two that's, that really say it clearly to the unsaved person. And uh, it's for you to just keep thinking about but I do think that uh, John is pretty unique. <laughs> All right. Thank you.